welcome to the Grin Gets Real podcast. Super excited to have you on here, not just because I've read your book, but I'm so interested in the topic of video in general and using it as a storytelling tool as a marketer. So welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited. I am too. Okay, so let's dive into it. Give the audience a little high-level overview of just kind of who you are and just your expertise and why kind of I've brought you here is because of your expertise. Okay, who am I? Well, that's a big question. I'll, I'll keep it brief. Exactly. Um, Don't start, start grade school. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, my <laughs> professional career started at the BBC. So I was um, a documentary maker at the BBC. So I was a content maker. You know, I learned how to tell engaging stories in emotive films and Traveled the world making documentaries, which is cool when you're in your 20s. And then when I got yeah. to my 30s, it was less cool. Um, and then left the BBC and I started an agency called Hurricane, which is a leading video marketing agency, which is based in, uh, in Europe. And we work with companies around the world. And basically what we do is we help C-suite and marketers um, and people like that to um, harness the power of video, really. So I've moved from being a, a publisher at the BBC to an advertiser. And I've written two books on the subject, one called Video Marketing Strategy, and then the new one's called Video Marketing. So I'm officially a nerd on all things video. And I work as a consultant for all sorts of people. This is exactly why you're on here because I nerded out as I was reading your book, the amount of like tabs that I put in here. Um, I'm going to ask you to do a workshop after this, but yeah, I, I figured I'd leave that for a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Get him to say yes while he's on the radio. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Um, so let's dive into it. Why does video even matter right now? Okay. Why does it matter? I mean, it's a really good question. Obviously it, it's just massive. It's everywhere. But I think the real reason it matters is because videos uh, videos will help brands grow. You know, it's the most powerful thing that advertisers ever had. Um, it's it's very much evolved. Um, every brand is now a publisher as well as an advertiser. So there's it's enormous appetite for video. Yeah. Um, so what we do with, I think the, the, the difference is between video and video marketing. And I think we should probably start with that definition. Video is massively popular. Yes. Video marketing is massively effective. So in video marketing, what we're doing is we're taking data-driven insights, you know, to deliver video content to multiple audiences across the sales funnel. So it's it's and multiple channels. So it's a very thoughtful, sort of complicated area, but that's how we deliver better sales, um, better sort of better click-through rates, all those kind of things. So the reason it matters is because it will make a difference at any point of the sales funnel from nobody knows who we are all the way through to we need to make a sale. I think that's that's pretty much it. And also, your competitors are doing it and they're going to benefit. So it's important to get on it and do it. Yeah. So how can you leverage video marketing to just kind of grow your business in general? Um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, I spend a lot of my time thinking about that. I think it's such a complicated area. It's not difficult, but it's complicated. So I think the first thing yeah. is to think about, you know, where is my problem? Have I got if I talk about the digital sales funnel, which we're all very used to, but have I got an awareness problem? In which case I need to do some search. I need to do some paid ad videos. I'm looking at my click throughs, reducing my cost per acquisition. You know, it's all that kind of nobody knows who I am. And that's the kind of hero films at the top of the funnel. But if people know who you are, but they're not converting, then we're talking about consideration content in the middle of the funnel. We're talking about increasing dwell times, telling our story, convincing uh -huh. people we, you know, we're really good. And then if people know who you are, they know your story and they're still not converting. It's about bottom of the funnel stuff, retargeted ads to push them over the line, um, discounts, and also just like case studies. So it, it, it will affect your business by where's your problem. And I think the, the, the anal analogy that I always give is like a spork. I don't know if you know what a spork is. A spork yes. is a spoon, spoon and a fork, right? And it's a shit spoon and a shit fork. Um, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so th there's a video marketing is about understanding the problem and solving it with one piece of content. Um, and then I think the other thing is it will affect your business because it's actually quite a lot of work. You know, if you decide yeah. to run a TikTok channel or you're going to run, um, I don't know, a, a YouTube channel from scratch, it's going to affect your marketing team because it's a load of work. Um, so it's a lot yes. of work, but if you get it right, it's super, super effective. 
What I really appreciate about something that I read in your book when you're talking about the funnel is that you make a very clear distinction that there is more content, more video content that you can create or more content in general that you create that's in that consideration phase. So you just described, you know, if people don't know you, that's that top of the funnel. And there are a lot of people that think it's more of a triangle and mm -hmm. this is... I wish I had a whiteboard. I could draw it out. It almost looked like this really fat pill in the yeah. middle of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Where you're like, okay, the, these are, and when, you, and when you're talking about the pain points, that is, those are the answers that you want to be able to give. And video marketing is definitely the format to be able to give that. Um, I understand all of that stuff. But what I think is really challenging in video marketing is what length does that what length do I create that video? How do I tell a story in, you know, 90 seconds versus, you know, 30 minutes? I, if you give me 30 minutes, I feel like you can really build it up and it really unfolds that story. So, you know, I'll land the plane, I promise, with my question. It's more of a how do you storytell in short form and long form so that it is answering kind of those questions or do you save short form for the top of the funnel and then the longer form for the middle of the funnel or is there even a recipe for that it's the classic how long should my video be question and literally every conference yeah. every conference i asked i get two questions one is how do I do it with no money? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. and, and the second question is, you know, how long should it be? And, you know, the answer is it should be somewhere between six seconds and two hours, which isn't a very useful answer, is it? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, great. <laughs> great. Great, 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 so, great, great. It, but you're that. absolutely right. It depends, <laughs> like, you know, it depends on where you are in the funnel. Um, if you're trying to get to someone on TikTok, you're going to be six to 15 and there's whole sorts of micro durational impacts there. If, if somebody is going to spend, let's say you're in a B2B brand, right? And somebody's going to spend yeah. a million pounds on a piece of engineering hardware. They're going to watch a two hour film, right? So it's yeah. about providing the correct duration for where you are in the funnel. So it's going to be shorter at the top. It's going to be medium to long in the middle. And at the bottom, it's going to be short again. But there is one, that said, there's one general rule. Less is more, okay. right? So whatever you're doing, if you say less, it's going back to the spork thing. Do one thing, do it really, really well. As soon as you start ramming in extra stuff and you go, oh, let's not make it 20 seconds. Let's make it 30 and put more stuff in. It's too long. If you can do it in 20, do it in 20. So the temptation is always to, to add more. Um, and when we're doing this in what we call messaging sessions, what we do is we get a whiteboard out and we put the post-it notes up on the wall and we put all the messages that, that the brand team want to say in the film. And then we have a post-it yeah. that's like, so what? And we have one thing. We are saying this one thing. And then we go through the post-its. And if they don't answer to the so what, to that one thing, we just pull it off the wall. So we go from 50 post-its to like six. And applying that mm -hmm. less is more to whatever you're doing is, um, is definitely the way to go. I can definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I was formerly the director of content. So like video design, the, the content piece is such a big part. And mm. I sit in the influencer marketing space. So I see a lot of, you know, creators putting together some really fantastic content. Um, one of the things that I think that brands often kind of get stuck on, quote unquote, stuck on mm. is the details that don't matter on a video. And what I mean yeah. by that is, oh, it's got to be this color and this font and this image. And while I'm saying those aren't important or don't add value, I think that if you miss the underlying storytelling, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what picture you use, what font and what color you use. Like I, I, I have this very strong belief that it's the story that gives the message and vi the video is the vehicle to deliver that story. So tell me what what role that brand story, or not even just the brand story, but whatever story it is that you're trying to tell has to do with video marketing for you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, story, how story impacts is massive. I think let's just yeah. start at the beginning. It's like when, when we're making effective films, we need to engage emotionally with somebody. Um, yep. and, and this, and I'll talk at length in a minute about why we need to do that. But we need to talk emotionally. As soon as you're talking about features and benefits, people basically don't care. That's for written yeah. stuff. Um, and there's a real temptation to, to if we put in enough information, we're going to persuade these people. 
So if we, um, how, can I can I ramble about system one, system two a little bit? Have you have you discussed this? Yes, in your podcast please. Before? Right. Okay. No, I haven't. But you okay. go at length in the book about it, so I yeah. I love this breakdown. I'm here. For <laughs> okay. It. So let's just think about how we function in the world around us. We have millions of decisions to make every day. We make about 12,000 decisions a day about food. Um, we cannot apply the same amount of thinking to each each type of as each type of decision making. So we can think about the mind being split into two systems, system one thinking and system two. System one is the stuff that's very instant. It keeps us alive. If you step out in front of a car and you hear a hot noise, you step back. You don't think about it. You you just do it. Um, system one thinking allows us to make decisions um, very quickly without thinking too much. That's how the brain likes to make decisions. Then we have system two, which is very thoughtful. If you're going to choose a mortgage or choose a partner or whatever, you'd have that sort of very detailed thinking system two. Um, and a nice analogy is, if you're driving along the road, you know you've been driving along the road, sometimes you don't really notice that you've driven anywhere because, well, how did I get yeah. here? You sort of drifted off. That's just system one has kicked in and it's going left, right, up, down, all the rest of it without thinking. Then you pull up to your space and there's a Mercedes in a Porsche and you've got to reverse into the gap. Suddenly your brain's like, right, I've got to think about this. And that's, that's yeah. system two. So that's giving you a, a, an outline of the system one, system two. The thing is, we can change behavior by talking to what we do what we want to do is talk to system one which is emotionally driven because the thing is if you get if you get the system one that the the quick emotion stuff to be to change its um, attitude towards you it doesn't even ask system two so you make somebody feel something and they will they will sort of contact with your with your brand basically this is why a lot of marketing is becoming emotionally driven yeah. However, if you just do the sensible system to have a long conversation about why it matters, people are going to tune out. So that's that's the kind of thing. Um, so that's what I'm properly rambling now. But there's a lot there's a lot there in the system one, system two is the, the core. Then what we're going to do is yeah. we're going to talk about how storytelling impacts on that. Okay. Let's just take for granted now that we want to we want system one to be who who we're talking to. It's driven by emotion. Okay stories are fantastic at changing emotions, right? So um, when we hear a story, the chemicals that cause emotion, they kick in, they hijack your cortex, and you suddenly throw away all those objectively observant skills. So everything we, we think about, we start hearing a story, the classic sort of three-part story, and we become emotionally engaged. The, the amygdala, uh, the hippocampus, they start kicking in to remember things. Suddenly our language centers spark up. We get this big rush of sort of neurochemicals and, and transmitters, so oxytocin, dopamine, all those sort of things. So when we tell stories, the human brain switches on, you know, and we're ready to be emotionally yeah. engaged. And um, this has been really studied really, really well by a guy called Dr. Paul Zak, um, who did a, a brilliant piece of work on the future of storytelling. So what Dr. Paul Zak did is he showed this really powerful film about a little boy called Ben. Um, Ben's dying of cancer um, and his dad's really upset because he wants to play with his son, but he can't play with him because he knows that his son's dying and he just can't deal with the emotions of it. So he shows everybody, Uh he showed thousands of people this film and he measured their blood chemistry before and after this powerful film. And what he showed was that actually, um, you know, there was a really strong empathic response to this very powerful film but there was actually yeah. a, a very a strong uptake in neurochemicals cortisol and oxytocin so we could show that powerful films actually made you do something and then the super cool thing was he was able to show that that oxytocin and that cortisol increase actually made people change their behavior so the people who had the largest uplift in those chemicals were more likely to donate money to a stranger in the lab in a room so we were able to show how you can change behavior by changing brain chemistry, brain chemistry. So make people feel stuff. They get this rise in chemicals. The chemicals then actually drive their behavior because they're feeling stuff. So, you know, we're changing behavior by changing brain chemistry when we talk about stories. Super interesting yeah. stuff. Nerdy, but super interesting. But I, I, I lo- I'm sitting in this nerdy space with you as well. And I love the... I love hitting the emotion because you're right. It is the, I am more likely to do anything when I'm tied to it, Mm. right? And it's interesting because the emotion that we're talking about doesn't necessarily have to be like this. I feel like when you're describing it, when you're trying to drive people to do something, it is 
almost like it sounds a little bit like you're trying to make people feel um, affection or or love. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm thinking about. But I almost think that like you can, it doesn't have to be like just the positive and not that I want to go dark on everybody. But I also think that a good brand storyteller can also be someone that shows you or makes you feel that negative emotion, but then like to get your attention and then shows you how that brand can solve that and relieve that. But Mm -hmm. they caught your attention with like that negative emotion as well too. Yeah, completely agreed. I I think when we're making films, we talk about emotional drivers. Um, And Mm -hmm. I've just told you that story about Ben. And when you're working with charities, emotional drivers are easy, right? Somebody's dying, somebody's poorly, I'm empathic. But what happens if you're a B2B brand and you're selling widgets, right? Or you're selling, you know, little technical things. An emotional driver isn't just happy, sad, angry. It's also fear of missing out, jealousy, laziness. It's the thing that actually makes people go, oh, okay, I need this thing. So um, there's a lovely, so we, when we talk about emotional drivers, we're not talking about those big primary emotions. We're talking about the thing that made people connect. There's a great film by a company called Talia. Now Talia, no disrespect to them. They make boring stuff. They make (laughs) e-invoicing software like you know they make invoicing for electronic invoicing stuff um really hard to sell but they do this amazing film and i'll send you a link later where um they're basically like look they've got this guy and he's tapping away doing his invoices manually um but then he gets rsi and because he gets rsi they give someone else a job they give it to the intern the intern fills in the intern does a better job than him the intern becomes his boss and basically it says like don't lose your job use an electronic invoicing so that you know you you don't lose your job and and it's a really comical kind of sort of situation but what they do there is they they go at the bottom of like, actually, you should probably look at this because you don't want to be shown up by anyone else. And that's a real important driver for someone who's looking at buying a, a new software or something like that. So there's always a, an emotion to leverage. Yeah, well, and I, you described a lot of different things is there in there too. You were talking about emotional drivers, but I... I see like such a good play on humor in regards mm. to that as well too. Yeah. So it's, it's this relief. It's this humor, like, Oh, I get it. I, you know, you solved it in like whatever length of time that was, which I don't mean to go back to like the length of time, but I do think that like brands right now do have this challenge because it's not when we're talking about videos and we're talking about video marketing, this is not a secret. Obviously everybody is doing it and they're all trying, they're all trying to do it. I also think that this is the huge reason that there is such an influx in content creators when it comes to just kind of influence marketing, like content creators are so good at, at hitting just kind of that emotion in the 90 seconds. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, creators in this video space and what they're doing right that brands can learn from yeah so you're talking about youtubers and and you know yeah. this kind of thing and I the mean, tiktokers also because i mean and, tiktok yeah. has just definitely it's turned into like such a new search engine right like if yeah. i'm looking for a recipe i can i can hit hashtag food talk and i've got all of the recipes on there and they give it to me in this very digestible ways that then I can click into Mm. something else. So I I think that they just do such a really great job in such a short amount of time, but also like YouTube, it's much longer. So, yeah, I mean, if you talk quietly off the record to Google people, they are very nervous that the young people, if they want to go out for dinner, they don't Google maps or Google it on places. They go on TikTok and they look what's around the corner. So people are Gen Zennials, as we like to call them, Gen Z and Millennials, which is a wonderful <laughs> word. You can have that. Um, you know, they are increasingly turning to, to TikTok as a search engine. Um, so where are we going with this? Um, uh, okay, what lessons can we learn? That was a question. It's yeah. brand story has to be wrapped in, I think, increasingly important. Uh, you, interesting information. I think when we're talking about video, it's really easy to go, oh no, it's this or it's that. And it's all about understanding, yeah. what, understanding what you're trying to do. There's still a place for the brand film. There's still a place for the, you know, the the explainers and the interviews. With yeah. That's all the whole thing. But there is an increasing need for content that's genuinely interesting. So we are yeah. working with a healthcare company at the moment, big international healthcare company about the future of um, healthcare and the environment. And we're making a five-part documentary series for them exploring um, 
the issue that the fact that actually, you know, that the healthcare industry puts out as much carbon as the fifth biggest uh, country in the world. But also, if we want people to be healthy, they've got to live on a good planet. So suddenly, we're not talking about this healthcare's policies and this healthcare company's policy. The lesson we can take is, is it genuinely interesting? Could it be a Netflix documentary? Could it be an entertaining thing on social in its own right? Let's not have too many corporate messages because people just don't care, right? If it is yeah. a corporate message, crack on. Philly Boots, brand film, brilliant. But if you're trying to do something to capture people's attention, how do we make it genuinely watchable, genuinely engaging and not, you know, just a bit brandy for no need? So that's working really well. well. I And I definitely agree, but there is so much noise out there that you have to really stand out. So do mm -hmm. you have any tips for a brand who really wants to double down on video marketing in 2023, right? Like, I've got like, so many. I've got a book full of tips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, scratch it, the surface. It, Give yeah, us some yeah. top three. Um, <laughs> okay. Number one thing is to start with the planning process, to go back to that digital okay. sales funnel. And like we said, it's narrow at the top because we can highly target who we're talking to. We don't need to do mass media anymore, but then the sales funnel mm -hmm. gets fat in the middle. We need a lot of content. People will stay in that consideration phase for days, months, years, whatever. Um, yeah. And then we need to drive them to take action. So there's a temptation. We need more videos. We need to make more content. Let's just start with yes. the problem. So we're working with a big automotive brand in the UK. They're electric car charging brand. There is, there's lots of things you could do. We could do a TV commercial. We can get the brand known. Actually, that's great. Everyone's going to know us, but actually let's start on page, on site, make sure that the video content we have has got lots of reviews. It's SEO friendly, it's search friendly, mm -hmm. and it's driving conversion so that when we st start doing a brand campaign and we're driving people to the traffic, we convert them. There's no point sending people to a page. It doesn't work. So number one tip is figure out actually what your problem is and then find a piece of content that's actually going to solve that problem. If you can reversion it okay. into other bits, like 10 second social cuts and whatever, do that. So that's number one. Um, that's number tip number one. Number two is um, is you have to have emotion at the beginning. So we're talking about three part films, emotion, fact, and action. Make that connection okay. so that people go, oh, I need it. Then give them some facts, as few as you can. But then give them somewhere to go. Drive some action. Give them a landing page. It's like if your film ends with the end or here's my logo or even worse, a link to the website when it's on your website. It's just like, come on, don't do that. Yeah. Tip three, this is a corker. Don't just don't use YouTube for embedding stuff. This is everywhere. Every conference I go to, I say, are you embedding stuff with YouTube on your site? And like hands go up and it's like, just don't do it. And the reason is this. If you go to your YouTube channel and look at sources, you know, traffic sources in your sources thing, yeah. you will find your own website is listed in those sources. And sometimes it's hundreds or even thousands of hits to your YouTube channel. So what's happening there is you're spending a load of money getting people to your website and they stay and they watch your uh -huh. video and they see the YouTube button and they click the YouTube button and they bugger off to YouTube and you never see them again. So you are actually sending people off your site by using YouTube um, and you're just losing money. So use a player like Vimeo, 23, Vidyard, anything which actually allows you to own the data and own the audience because really YouTube doesn't care whether they're on your website well, it actively wants them off your website to be honest so there you go three little three little tips I like that one of them is planning two is use emotion I like yeah. the three part as well too and then the third is don't embed YouTube use something it's really like functional video. yeah yeah I, I like that I like that. And it's true. I would have raised my hand as well, too, with the whole embedding, with the whole and, embedding and, yeah. and, the, and the whatnot. That's so crazy that you said that. I'm you like, can just uh -oh. see people's heads go, oh, shit. <laughs> They're just like, they spent all this <laughs> I money. Yeah, oh. I did that. I did that internally. I was like, oh. <laughs> it's but you don't think about it, but as soon as you see it, it makes, it makes total sense. Um, it does make sense. I mean, which is great if your goal is to drive more people to YouTube versus your website. But I think well, most, you, you know, you need to look at the B2B two separately anyway. There's a lot of people who go, we'll host it on YouTube. Um, and then, so you need to have a, a, a video strategy for your website, which is based around SEO, search, retention, 
conversion, all that stuff. And then you have to need to have a YouTube strategy, which is about nothing but growing your audience. Because really that's all uh-huh. YouTube is good for. Growing your audience quickly, scaling it, getting attention, brand awareness. It's not about click-throughs. It's not about purchases. It's not about, you know, putting things in baskets. It's just literally becoming famous. Um, See, so those two things are very different. They're very different. Very I don't. Different. Yeah. And I think, I think that there are a lot of people that I don't want to say miss that because I think that sometimes, you know, as a brand, what we want to do is you want to grow everything and become like this resource mm-hmm. for people who are searching for answers that you solve. That's essentially what we want to do. And I think mm-hmm. that YouTube is really great from like a search perspective in the same way that TikTok is really great from a search perspective. So I'd imagine like a video strategy in YouTube is this combination of those YouTube shorts and the long form. And then also having like the SEO rich description and title and tags mm-hmm. and calls to action that you want from that. But ultimately it is also just kind of teaching people too. Yeah. I mean, YouTube is about hacking the algorithm, which is a trendy phrase that we use all all the time. So 75% of the views on YouTube come from recommended, right? So you Mm. need to get recommended and you only get recommended if you have over 30 pieces of content, 20, 25, depending on who you are, and you're posting regularly and it's well SEOed and it's well signposted. And it's like, once you hack Mm -hmm. that algorithm, your views will step up massively. So, you know, I've done some work with YouTubers who are starting out and nothing happens, but you keep up the frequency, you keep up the thing, then it picks you up, then you get recommended and you you scale. But that's only if your brand goal is get famous. If your brand goal is deliver quick sales, then don't bother doing it because it's way too much work. There's, it's it just so on what much work. Do. Yeah. It is so much work. And I think, you know, honestly, one of the things that I, that I love that you said at the beginning was how much time it does take to put together content. So it's less about putting together like those 50 videos that you think that you have to have, and maybe just really concentrating on 10. 10 that you're going to do throughout the year and that you're going to really knock it out of the park and do it well and take your tips of planning using emotion, right? Mm. And not embedding something. But um, (laughs) that that one doesn't feed into it. It's the two tips that really feed into like the the video part, right? But like, I I think those are so key. I could really talk to you forever because, you know, you, you drop some tidbits of your book in here. And this could be a book club as well, too. This happens to be always the issue that I run into with the guests that I'm super fangirling over. But at last, we have the prediction time question. So Mm -hmm. what do you see happening with video and video marketing over maybe like the next year? I'm going to have more than one. A number Give of them things. to like, me. Firstly, the landscape yeah. is going to become more complex. So when I started mm. out, we used to well, we used to broadcast on television. Then we used to post DVDs, and then it was like then we had to have a sixteen nine and a nine sixteen and a one one and all these different formats. And then yeah. you, so what's going to happen over the next year is definitely there's going to be more places you could do it, and more people saying my shit's better than anyone else, and you should put your thing yeah. here. So it's even more imperative that you go back to the plan and you figure out which one of those noisy platforms is for you. That's definitely going to happen. The other thing that's going to happen is increased personalization and interactivity. And this is the super cool thing. So if we think about video, it's typically what we would call like a lean back kind of thing. You sit back, you watch it. So how can we increase engagement rate by making it lean in? And that's by adding simple interactivity, click hotspots, um, what we call branching, where people are choosing their own adventure, you know, watch a bit, yeah. a bit more. And when we go back to the duration thing, give them 20 seconds of cool stuff, then give them an option to watch the four or five chapters that they are looking, they're interested in. That's how you do that. And then personalized video, which is increasingly important, which in summary is when you send everybody a different video that has their name in it or um, has something personal to them in it. So they watch it. You, you know, we're working with a bank and they send out an email that says, hi, Pete, um, you have this much money in your bank and you've invested this and you've made this much interest. And it's all in there. Um, and it gets delivered via email and engagement rates are insane. So number one is, I think it's all about technology. It's going to make the landscape more complicated, but it's going to make it more interactive with cool, with much higher engagement rates. 
you know, my predictions are very much going to be driven by technology. Um, technology is going to change not only the complexity of what we're doing, but also increase interactivity. And I feel pretty confident I'll, I'll happily stand by those. Yes. And what I think really speaks into just that prediction that you're having is that we are living in a digital digital world. Everybody has access to everything in the palm of their hands, at their fingertips, quite literally. And I'm starting to see a ton of what it is that you're you're talking about as well, especially with D to C customers or not customers, D to C brands, right? Like it is the pop-up videos that come up on the website, there's a lot more software that's out there that is providing that kind of functionality that you are predicting. And I, I think it's more, it will be more rampant and you do have to have that, especially because people will double, triple down on video marketing in general, on videos and video marketing in general. I, I would say that like more people are going to do video marketing. And I love that you had to find that at the top of the podcast that those are two different things, right? There mm. is video and then there is video marketing and that is the more strategic play. Well, thank you so much. Oh. I absolutely appreciate you coming on here. Let me Great know if you have any other predictions, any no. other tips. Yeah. I mean, I've okay. got loads of them, but um, no, it's just really good to just to be, talk the basics so to get people going in the right yeah. direction. And it's great to be here. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Mm.